Welcome back to RSA Conference 2022. It, it's, it's the last day. We're still live at the Marriott Marquis, but it is day four. I'm your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview segment is Mark St. John. He is Senior Vice President of Product at Looking Glass Cyber. Mark, welcome. Oh, glad, to, glad to be here. So you want to talk about attack surface monitor, and we've been already having this chat on the side as we were getting ready for this segment. Um, let's start with the foundation of why did you decide to m go down the path of attack surface monitor? I've seen lots of vendors entering this space. Mm -hmm. And w what problem or challenge did you see, and, and why did you start to build out this capability? Well, for me, I have a background in incident response. So the, the big driver for me was always going on site in an incident with highly skilled engineers and people telling us, we don't know how they got in. It must have been somebody in, insanely sophisticated. And then come to find out it was always a server left in a closet, a DNS record pointing somewhere that was old that they didn't realize was still active. Just little basic things of hygiene, you know, that, mm -hmm. that didn't keep up with, keeping up shop. Um, so we said, how can we help people keep track of this ongoing? Sure, there's inventory management systems, but a lot of times those require a lot of heavy lifting and th their own teams. And how can we discover and, and sort of take away and s simulate a little bit what the attackers are doing at the reconnaissance phase and get rid of the targets of opportunity and sort of the low-hanging fruits and start there, give them a baseline, do that every day, and then expand the capabilities out and merge in some other things like threat intelligence and uh, other bits of context that they can use to, to keep, you know, keep the storefront clean. Yeah, and we've seen, it, it touches a lot of adjacency markets, right? You've mm -hmm. got the asset management players, Exonius, Jupiter One, et cetera, um, going after the asset side of this. Yep. You have um, breach and attack simulation vendors doing some shift, some of the automated pen testing companies moving here. So I've seen lots of different adjacencies. When you think about how these pieces fit together, what are some of the foundational elements of an attack surface monitoring capability? Because I think when you see all this stuff and you say, yes, I'm going to discover your assets, the, the distinctive answer is, oh, I got an asset management system. I yep. don't need it, right? Yep. But we know that's not true. Yep. Well, we probably, yes, they have one, but it's probably not up to date, right? Yep. And so what are some of those fundamental elements of an attack surface monitoring capability? Well, the fundamental elements to me is starting outside in. So okay. you get the attacker viewpoint at all times and then your basic you know your asns your networks domains all the services that are always exposing themselves all the software that you can enumerate all the way through the web stacks all your javascript libraries um, and then repeatedly doing those and then of course mixing in a little cloud thing you know your cloud storage buckets mm -hmm. um, common configuration things default configurations looking for really anything that uh, can be mitigated that you can sort of take off the board from an attacker right. and to me those are the fundamentals and then you can layer on all of the different uh you know either threat intelligence or you can use it as you know the the automated red teaming which which i think is a wonderful you know utility of it as well um but th that's the table stakes once you, once you have that data then you can start getting more creative but those are really the the starting points yeah so i i, I discover all my assets there's a couple different ways to do this so mm -hmm. i'm curious how you do it um, understand where those external exposures are. The next question is going to be, how do I correlate to that to the inside of the network, right? So let's start with, you know, the approach to identify assets of the of the attack surface, and then let's go in. What what do I need to correlate on the inside to understand the relationship between what you're seeing externally and what you're seeing mm -hmm. internally? Because sometimes that's a different view. It, yeah, it's a much different view. And internally, you can start piecing together from you can reuse your inventory management systems, you can use Active Directory, you can use any of your authentication mechanisms, and it, even from there you can move to another part of uh, attack surface, getting into identity management as well. Mm. Moving back to intelligence, you know, finding compromised credentials and getting those at, off the table, but um, you know, some people are using, you know, network detection. You see uh, products like Rumble out there using right. ARP to detect. Uh, you see people out there with scanners and agents, uh, le often sometimes leveraging their, their EDR tooling mm -hmm. as well for the inventory. So there's a lot of different ways to generate that data into a, to a s sort of single catalog as well. Got it. Yeah. And then are you doing external scans to find that external footprint? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. So you're scanning... Are you scanning the whole internet, or are you scanning customers' we do known a, domains? Right, we, there's a we, variation we, here. <laughs> we, we do we do both. Um, okay. We we do the entire internet. You know, utilize that type of data for 
helping third party risk and, and supply chain type of attack surface. Right. But for individual customers who want to do their organization in their domain, we do a much more almost like an exacto knife approach. Uh, you know, enumerate all the domains, subdomains, all your all your security certificates, all your registrar information, find any other info they've they've gotten, and then you know start your continuous scanning. You know, get your you know uh, headless web browsers out. You throw different users agent user agents at it, try to get all the different software libraries back, libraries back, and then keep doing that over and over. Yeah, it reminds me of the early days of all management where you used Nmap to go map mm -hmm. the network. Yep. And then once I knew what the assets were, then I could go out and do a vulnerability scan. It sounds yep. kind of similar, very right? Similar, yeah. Very similar, very um, similar. And you know, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a lot of people use attack surface manage management as a way to feed their vulnerability management program. Mm. Finding new assets, helping discover where they may or may not have uh, the scanning ca capability pointed at, and then also fine tuning. You know, uh, building a catalog of you know this a, a web asset, using a web scanner against it versus you know a different scanner. Uh, maybe even saving a little money on how they're utilizing their their vulnerability tools. You know, maybe they're a little overzealous and just pointing it at, at wide networks. Um, so I see it definitely as a way to feed vulnerability management. Got it. So as I think about um, use cases here, I identify, I'll call it a, a risk instead of a threat, mm -hmm. okay, for a second. I've identified some risk based on my attack surface. The next evolution is what do I do about it? So does this tie into incident response capabilities at Looking Glass Cyber? Is it SOAR workplace? Like, because somebody's got to go clean this up, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to go change the configuration, remove the malware, yeah. whatever it is, right? It's all about the response side of the equation, right? Yeah. And we've seen a lot of vendors go down the path of detection, they have great detections. But I need to make it actionable, and I need to help the customers make that action. And we've seen the evolution of SIM and SOAR, and now XDR, and all the buzz terms around it, mm -hmm. and oh my gosh, my head spins. But what are those actions as you identify this data, and then how do you orchestrate those? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first action, the biggest one for me, is being able to answer questions. You know, um, the big question of, now that we lived in the, we live in the era of the, the vulnerabilities and the exploits that seem to have their own marketing team, and it generates mm -hmm. a huge hype. So you'll have a CISO say, I need to know what I'm doing about the next, you know, sneaky, sneaky dragon, or just making that up, right? Um, but you can act, you can make the data actionable by saying, okay, we have Sneaky Dragon uh, targets this VPN product. We have it in these places. They're on these different versions. And you can have that data in seconds instead mm -hmm. of having to task different teams to go find it. Right. So from there, you're answering a posture question. The, the second piece of that is when they see those, how prevalent is it? What, what are the mitigation steps? Do we need to patch? Can you use threat intelligence to find out if the actors that are using it are even targeting our sector? Right. What, what's the probability of that? Yep. So it gives you a little leeway. I don't, I don't want to call it comfort, but it gives you a little more clarity to make decisions on how aggressive you need to be in taking the mitigation steps, whether it's patching or you know, taking something offline, you know, crippling a service mm -hmm. for the sake of it. Right. Um, and that's to, that's to me the biggest action piece. How it fits into detection, I don't really see those two overlaying a bit unless you're using that threat intelligence data feeding the feeding your you know your sensors your edr your xdr uh type of things doesn't really play so much in with attack surface management to me other than using the data the the discovered asset data yeah. to make sure that you have your tooling there to make sure you have your right. xdr make I sure you have your edr running yep. integrate the data into my sim source slash xdr mm -hmm whatever that product's gonna look like for yep. you, so that you can then assign either a forensics or a remediation yes. activity yep. out of it, right? Yep. Yeah, because that is really the next step. Yep. Because yep. as I talk to vendors in this space, it's always about, now what? I have the data, but now mm -hmm. what? And you know, when you think about Costa Rica for a second, right, and, and, the, and the challenges they've struggled with, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. When you have, when you don't have visibility into the data, but as soon as you see those indicators, like how do you move quickly to resolve it? And I was talking to one of my CISO buddies, I'm interviewing him later today. I said, okay, if a box were compromised with Conti malware, what would you do as a CISO? He goes, strip it down the bare metal and start over. But that requires a team to go out and do it because yep. you can't automate that step. Well, right. maybe Intel vPro might be able to do it. Anyways, but, but that's kind of the step, right? And so I just try to think about how these products continue to create value for the customers mm -hmm. and how does it integrate with their existing investments? Because, 
you know, these these uh, organizations have budgets. They're probably going to come under a little bit of tightening as mm-hmm. the market slows down a little bit. So how does attack surface monitoring make their role management better, make their XDR better, right? And I hope yeah. that's kind of the vision of where, where you see yeah, this plane. Yeah, sure. And it's, you know, you, you can't secure what you don't know, right? And yeah. so making sure that constant visibility and constant context is there, then you can decide on what tooling you need if, you know, budgets are cut and you need to strip something down. What, what program can you take away and how does it affect it overall? And then layering on, you know, understanding where you are and going back to, understanding what attackers are targeting your segment or your businesses or your country, yeah. you know, you can make those decisions a lot uh, with a lot more context and a little more confidence, I would think. Yeah, you know? I think that is the challenge. Like, yeah. they don't know what they don't know. But some CISOs may not want to know either, which is always an interesting dilemma, well, right? Well, that's, they'll find out real quick. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do they do they allow the breach to happen or do they actually go resolve mm-hmm. it before the breach happens? Either way, you're not in a right. great position, no. right? But it's interesting as I've, I've talked to a lot of companies in the space, it's it's really their go-to-market strategy of, of tapping into those uh, CISO budgets because there's got to be a value add there mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And I think you've done a good job of articulating where some of those cross points are. Uh, the other thing is consolidation in the market quickly, mm-hmm. right? I've seen a lot of vendors pivot from certain capabilities into attack surface monitoring, automated pen testing mm-hmm. to ASM, uh, DAST scanning, you yep. know, dynamic application security testing mm-hmm. into ASM. Um, I think there's going to be some consolidation here where automated pen testing with continuous controls monitoring slash security validation, whatever you want to call it, attack surface monitoring, they start to come together. They provide more value together yep. than three separate products. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Yeah. Kind of what's your roadmap yeah. vision for that? I, I think that's definitely going to continue to be a player. Um, I think for the th- I think the third-party risk management is going to continue mm-hmm. to leverage more of attack surface management as well to, to, to feed that data and those insights. And I think we'll also start to see um, API security become a, a, part or mm-hmm. a part of the attack surface management uh, ecosystem, I yeah. should say. Uh, there's, you know, just on the floor at RSA, you're seeing people do a lot of really interesting stuff already with API security oh, yeah. and some of the discovery methodologies they're using. Um, I, I think that'll get sucked up in pretty quick as well. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there are a lot of new startups in that API security yeah. space because it is such an open um, area that mm-hmm. has to be addressed. But you mentioned the third parties, which is interesting because when you think about the traditional third party risk management vendors for a second, like the GRCs and the IRMs, mm-hmm. They're not really in a position, I don't think, to do some of this. There's a, maybe one or two that can have the scale to ingest that data and do something. Yep. But then you've got the other, the kind of the scoring ones on mm-hmm. the outside. Um, my guess is there is some integration there as well, just because yep. as they're out looking at third parties, how is it influencing their scorecards and their risk models for that? So, again, there's some interesting adjacencies yep. in this space. Yep, and and some of those more scoring model ones, they, they do a great job of giving you, um, you know, the score, right? Uh, I, I think where where they need to be going is moving into the more tactical view. Where where in your supply chain are you actually linking applications? Yes, it kind of goes back to APIs, right? Where are you doing data to data, machine to machine connectivity, uh, and bringing that visibility up to? And that's that's one of the things that we're trying to help solve as well. Yeah, it's great to know there's a risk with the vendor, mm-hmm. but understanding what those risks are and where yep. they are to go mitigate them yep. is the next level. And that's where I think something like an ASM integrated with threat intelligence and some of these other kind of posture configuration management capabilities allows those traditional third party kind of scorecard vendors actually give you more actionable detail. Yep. It makes it really easy then to go out and mitigate because the pushback of vendors, vendors like, uh, no, prove it to us, right? Yep. Prove us that we're right. that way, right? So there's a lot of friction with some of those scoring models because they're like, without the detail, you're going to get a lot of pushback, like yes. prove to me that that's an issue, yep. right? And you, so you're going to have to correlate it with some of those internal components to actually prove it. Yep. And and being able to have the hard data, here's you know here's here's where our data points meet, or here's where we're talking machine to machine. We mm-hmm. fixed our end, go fix your end. It's right. an easier conversation other than saying, hey, you're a you're a 97 or you're a B B minus. We need you to be an A. How do you how do you make that score move? So right. given, given the data, given them a, a point to move with that's mutual, you know, we've done our mm-hmm. part, you do yours. And I think that's what helps with that tactical part. Awesome. Yep. Mark, it was great having a conversation today. Thank yeah, you for joining us. Yep. If anybody wants to learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash looking glass. Stay tuned. We have a few more interviews left for today.